Hey friends, I'm Cal Walters, and I'm here to tell you that leadership matters. Leadership is a choice. It's available to all who are willing to learn about it, to pursue it, and to implement it in all of its messiness. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Intentional Leader Podcast. Let's go make it count. General McChrystal, welcome to the show. It is an honor and a privilege to have you on today. Cal, it's my pleasure. And call me Stan, please. <laughs> okay. I'm a retired guy now. <laughs> okay. All right. Will do. Um, well, sir, Stan, it is, uh, I really am excited to talk to you, one, because of the leadership experience you have, but also just the, the time that you spend thinking about leadership. And I really enjoyed your book leaders. And, you know, I think one of the things that's unique about you is you're, you're very nuanced in the way you think about leadership. And I think part of that is your experience, but also just the way you look at people in their context. Uh, and so I wanted to start out by going back a little bit and asking you to reflect a bit on your father, uh, general Herbert McChrystal, uh, obviously <laughs> you've, you've seen a lot of leaders, um, but you also grew up with one and, and probably many people that shaped you. So tell us a little bit about him and how you think he marked you the most. Yeah, thanks for asking, Cal, because I love thinking and talking about my father. He passed a few years ago, but lived to 89, an extraordinary life and left six kids. My dad was the son of a soldier. So my grandfather was a career soldier and my father was one of three kids. He was the youngest, two older sisters. And he went to, he had a dream to go to West Point and he went to West Point and entered in the summer of 1942. And as you can imagine, that's kind of a funny time to, yeah. to enter the military academy. And they cut the course to three years. Oh. And so he graduated in June of 1945 very focused on World War II, but his class didn't essentially go to World War II because before they could finish their follow-on training, the war had ended. And so he went off to, to serve in first post-war Germany, had some fascinating experiences there, and then combat in Korea, and then a number of assignments, and ultimately commanded a battalion and brigade in combat in Vietnam. Now, the thing that was impactful about my father is like a lot of people's father he was my hero and he was a soldier and I knew that he was a good soldier an infantryman, but I was never around him soldiering much because my first memory is I was age three and we had just moved to the Washington DC area so we could serve in the Pentagon. And so I saw him in his uniform, but never around troops. And then he left the family there, went to Vietnam, came back, served in the State Department as a military officer, and then went back to Vietnam and then came back. So I had a vision of him as a soldier around troops and in the field, but I never saw that. Um, what I saw was a guy who was very quiet and self-effacing. He was a great father, you know, easygoing. Uh, I mean, he, was, he could be really funny. I mean, he was always doing home projects. And I remember, you know, I was always like the, the carpenter's helper. He did not invite me to make any important cuts or <laughs> drive any important nails or anything like that. I went to go get the hammer sort of a thing. And he used to, to tell these old jokes like he'd go, put your brains in the footlocker. I'll do the thinking around here. <laughs> and the other thing I remember about him, and it was true of my mother as well, I never saw him once do anything wrong. And you say, now, wait a minute, I never saw my parents. No, I mean, I never saw my father take a parking place he shouldn't have, mm. park the car illegal. I never saw my father keep extra change from a clerk. I never saw my father do a wink and a nod and say, hey, we just pulled one over on the system. He and my mother were both just not that way. And so as a consequence, I never saw him be unkind to anybody. I'm sure he could be a, a hard guy at times, but I never witnessed it. And so when I... I remember that uh, famous movie about uh, the great Santini and that, that very Robert Duvall played that very boisterous aviator. My father was the opposite of that. Hmm. My father was always kind of quiet and self-effacing, which seemed to be a tension with the idea of a combat infantryman. Um, and so 
he became a model for me in the standpoint of the kind of leader that I wanted to be, couldn't and didn't always live up to it, but very, um, very steady. Now, then I also watched my mother died suddenly when I was 45 and my father was a very new Brigadier General not long back from Vietnam and with six kids and my mother died, literally got sick mid morning uh, in January of 1971. And by late that night, she had passed. Mm, wow. And I remember my father coming back and seeing a man in shock. He lost a lot of soldiers in combat, but he just lost the love of his wife, of his life after 20, Five years of marriage, I think 24, 25 at the time. And he's got the six kids in this rising army career, and it, sl it swept his legs out from under him. You know, I, I watched him for the next few years struggle. Hmm. He struggled with alcohol, he struggled with some other challenges. And he finally, after a few years, got right and lived the rest of his life very happily. But I watched how easy it is for a good person a good man to be so impacted by things of life over which he had no control. Mm -hmm. How old were you when your mother passed away? I was 16. 16. And, okay. Uh, had two younger brothers and then three older siblings. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned his kindness. When I, before this interview, I actually reached out to Ryan Hawk about you. I was asking him what stood out most to him about your leadership. And he mentioned your kindness. Uh, I wonder, so one of the things that I, I could imagine is challenging as a very senior leader in the military is keeping your ego in check. Uh, you, you rise through the ranks, you get the stars on your chest. Now you're the you know, founder and CEO of a successful company. How have you been able to keep your ego in check? Yeah, I got married. <laughs> that helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Know? Amen to that. <laughs> and, and and I've got a sarcastic son and three smart ass granddaughters. Um, uh, you know, I, I say that tongue in cheek, but but it is true. When you get senior, you do have that danger of starting to believe your own press releases, sort of a deal. You start to think because people salute and they bow and scrape and they're ready when you're there, that that, that is deserved by you because you, after all, are a really great person. And the danger is starting to believe that and realizing that they're actually bowing and scraping for the four stars you wear, which is just based on the position that you hold. And so it's really important to have people around you who will tell you that the emperor is not only naked, but stupid, <laughs> uh, to have somebody who will tell you you're wrong. And so there's that first part of it, but, but this is a balance because I say that and it sounds easy, but at the same time, organizations and followers want a leader who shows some self-confidence. Mm -hmm. So you don't want a leader who is so timid and so unsure of themselves that, and so humble that they can't get things done. So there's a balance that you've got to be confident for the organization, confident in what your role is going to be but don't confuse it with who you are. Don't start to believe uh, something that isn't true. And then the last part I'd say is what I tell people, they ask me what the most important part of leadership is. I'd say self-discipline because we typically know what the right thing to do is, how we should treat people, how we should interact. And when we don't, it's often just because we have that either moment or in some people more than one moment of lack of self-discipline mm -hmm. when you, you can be a jerk and get away with it because no one will stop you. And the only thing that keeps you in check is your self-discipline. And if you don't, it doesn't happen. And, and I, my, big, my moments of greatest disappointment, and I'm guilty of it all the time, not, not every minute, but routinely, mm -hmm. I will treat somebody in a way I know I shouldn't have treated them. And then after it, I will immediately say, you know, and I tend to joke, I say, that was the bad stand. And I shouldn't let bad stand out. Mm. And, and when I have a good day, he doesn't come out much. And when I have a bad day, he's, too, he's, uh, he's out more often. 
Yeah. I think that it reminds me of something John Maxwell said, you know, we all have good in us and certainly we all have bad in us. And I think that demonstrates humility that I think that is certainly one way to keep yourself humble is knowing I'm, I'm not all good. There's plenty of, plenty of bad in me. And sometimes the bad stand comes out. Sometimes the bad cow comes out. Uh, certainly to your point about uh, a, a spouse, I, I can relate to that for sure. Um, I, I'm curious, you mentioned your dad and just how he, you never saw him do anything wrong. Did he talk about that? Did he, did he, did he talk about the importance of that or did he just model it? Modeled it. I, I never remember my parents sitting me down and telling me what kind of person I should be or what kind of man. There would be little conversations when I was doing something wrong or stupid and they would give feedback that was you know, corrective in nature. Um, when I was a, a, I think 12 years old, I was playing little league baseball in Arlington, Virginia. And I was just good enough to be one of the better players on my team and, but not half as good as I thought I was. And so I started getting fairly pumped up about myself. And I remember at one point, I think it was my father who said, because I was opining about how the team ought to be run. And he says, you can play or you can coach, but you can't do both. That's good. And he would do it. He wouldn't pull me aside. It, was, it wasn't a big father-son talk, but it was just sort of a, mm -hmm. a sarcastic jive. And I got the message. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, As I was doing my research and preparing for this, uh, it made me think when I was at West Point, I did not go in thinking I was going to go infantry. In fact, I was kind of the exact opposite. I didn't have any military in my family. My, my granddad served in World War II, but other than that, like I, I, and this is embarrassing to say, I hardly knew what West Point was. Um, but I got there and there were, there was one tactical officer in particular, his name now, I think he's, he may be promoted now to general, but Jeff Van Antwerp. I met him, I think it may have been my junior year. At that point, I was not going infantry, but he was the coolest guy ever. He, I think he came from Hawaii or he, he had been stationed in Hawaii, just had this surfer look, just incredibly fit. And after meeting him, I wanted to go infantry. And it, it made me think about your experience a little bit with Major Barado, a uh, tactical officer at West Point. And I was curious if you could just tell us about how he impacted you as a tactical officer at West Point. Absolutely. But let me first tell you how we impacted Jeff Van Antwerp. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> My nephew, uh, who's now an army colonel, was just graduated from West Point. I was stationed at Fort Benning as the commander of the 75th Range Regiment. And so these second lieutenants come down and they hang out at our house because there's food and beer and that sort of thing. Naturally. Yeah. And we had a friend of ours just down the street who had a bunch of daughters. And so one of them, very, very attractive young lady, my wife, who's the ultimate matchmaker says, wow, we need to have her over when we're having these lieutenants over. And she and Jeff now, I think they have seven kids. Yeah, no way. <laughs> so we <laughs> brag about that, say we caused that one. Oh, and wow. That's awesome. Jeff's father lived next door to me at Fort uh, uh, McNair as well. Great soldier in his own right. Wow. Um, yeah, Major Barato, this is an interesting story because he became Major General Barato and a hero and friend of mine. But I had been my first two years at West Point, and unlike you, I didn't know a lot about West Point, but my father had gone, so I thought I knew a lot about West Point. <laughs> so I went to West Point not taking the place seriously, because I went to West Point thinking that it was a, a short stop on my way to being an infantry lieutenant and going to Vietnam, which mm -hmm. is what I wanted to do. But I get to West Point, and West Point, as you know, takes itself very seriously. So the, for the first two years, I got in a lot of trouble. I got what they call slugged while I was still in beast barracks as a new cadet, which is kind of impossible, but I did. And then over the next two years, I got four major slugs. And so I came within a hair's breadth of getting thrown out on the number of demerits that I had my, my yearling or sophomore year. And I was only saved by the fact that the way a tactical officer wrote up my final big transgression he wrote it in words that gave me a much smaller punishment than he might have. <laughs> and so as a consequence, I didn't go over in demerits and I survived my uh, sophomore year. And so I came to the beginning of my junior year sort of as 
a convicted felon, you know, on probation. And that's the way some of my classmates thought of me and my grades were lousy for my first two years as well. And I went into the, the uh, first meeting with the new tactical officer. We'd had a tactical officer for the first two years. Now we had a new one. Everybody kind of wondering about him. So he has each cadet in for a personal counseling session. And he brings me in and I sit down across from this guy and he'd been in special forces in Vietnam. And he was kind of soft-spoken. And he said, I've looked at your record. And he says, I think you're gonna be a great leader as a cadet. And I think you're gonna be a great army officer. And I remember kind of craning my head on to see if he had the wrong file. I said, do you know who you're talking to? He says, I do. And I said, well, okay. Well, on what basis do you, do you make that judgment? Because not everybody would make that judgment. And he said, well, let me tell you what I see in you that I think is going to do that. And he described those positive things I'd had in my, my record to date. And my peer ratings were, were very strong and things like that. And he goes, nope, you're going to do great. Stand and watch. And it was interesting, partly because of that conversation, partly because I just started dating the, the girl who's now my wife of 45 years. Um, that sort of put me on the straight and narrow, Major Barato's confidence in me. And then the fact that we, maybe I committed every transgression you could. And so there was no original sin left. So my last two years, I went from being, you know, sort of a, a screw up at the bottom of the class to suddenly being Dean's List and being, you know, relatively successful for the, for the final two years. It was, a, it was a pretty interesting shift. And a lot of more factors outside my control, but the reality was he was a big part of it. And I, he became another person I wanted to be like. And later when I was a Lieutenant, I uh, was in the 82nd Airborne, been there for 18 months or so, almost two years. And I shifted to special forces to join his battalion. He was a battalion commander in special forces. And that was a great experience. Now that you've spent a lot of time thinking about leadership, how important is that to have someone that you want to be like? Is that, do you think that's an important part of development for a young leader? I think it's essential. You know, we have to have some idea of what we can be and what it would be like were we that. I used to tell young soldiers when you ask them to re enlist, and I, you know, you, you lay it out, I want you to re-enlist in the army. And they go, well, I didn't like it much. I said, you were a private. I'm not asking you to re-enlist as a private. Everything going forward, unless you do something really bad, is going to be as a sergeant, a senior sergeant, whatnot. Life's going to be very different. So don't look back, look forward and decide if that's the life you want. Similarly, when I was a, a young lieutenant and captain, I would look up and I'd see if I wanted to be like the captains and the majors and the lieutenant colonels that were above me. And... As, as I'm sure all of us have, I ran into some that I said, I really would like to be as much like that as possible. You can never try to model yourself completely, but there are ways that they act, things they do, competencies they, they've developed that give you a model that can go forward. Now, this also gets to some of the social things about you know, diversity and whatnot, and why we've got to have role models mm -hmm that look like us. There yeah. were a lot of white male role, role models in the army for me to choose from. A female officer or a minority had a much smaller population they could look to. And that's why it's so important. Yeah. It makes me think I was in a course two years ago. It was a group of judge advocates. We were all, army lawyers and we were all in a big group and we were all majors. So kind of mid-level management and uh, one of the black judge advocates, Jags, uh, mentioned, you know, we were having a kind of an honest conversation about diversity. And he said, you know, when I look at the senior leaders, I don't see anyone that looks like me. And it was the first time, and it's amazing how stories stick with you and how they impact you, but it was the first time I'd ever thought about that as a white man in an organization led by, you know, very great high character white men. Uh, but it, that, that shifted my perspective for sure, because how different would it be? How would you view your future in an organization if you don't see anyone that you could be like, or that at least you can kind of relate to in a direct way like that? So that was, uh, yeah, I think that, that highlights the importance of it. Um, 
I'd like to ask you, so when I look at your story uh, and, and the way your army experience finished uh, at, at, at commanding uh, the forces in Afghanistan, one of the things that's most impressive to me is your transition and the way you were able to transition from a, kind of an abrupt ending to your career into teaching at Yale, into now leading a very successful private sector organization. And I think it's a great example of personal resilience. So I wonder if you could talk to us, especially for all of us who are you know, struggling a little bit right now as we're navigating through COVID, what can we glean from how you navigated the end of your career to transitioning into, into this, you know, really landing not just on your feet, but in, in, a, in a very impressive way, showing up an ability to succeed in both the military and the private sector. Yeah, Cal, thanks for asking. And, and I'm really happy about the way it's turned out. And a lot of your listeners won't remember, to me it was yesterday, but for many who were younger, my career ended when an article came out in Rolling Stone magazine that depicted my command group, the people around me, as having a locker room attitude and being dismissive of senior leaders, Vice President Biden and whatnot, and not being professional. And many of these people I'd been around for many years in combat together with a tight team. But the reality was this article came out and uh, I didn't think it was fair, but I knew I was responsible for it. Meaning if I either created the atmosphere or let the reporter around that, that, that allowed the article, it was mine to own. And so I was called to see the president. I carried my resignation to him, offered my resignation. President Obama was uh, completely professional and gentlemanly and thoughtful about it. And he accepted my resignation. And I'd been in the army 30 commissioned for 34 years. And I walked out of the Oval Office and it's like being hit by a thunderbolt. Everything that I was a soldier from, I grew up in an army family, went to West Point at age 17. All my identity as a soldier and as an honorable person and all was now essentially ripped away. And my sense of reputation because the idea that I was being removed because we were disloyal or unprofessional. I always thought I could be killed in war. I could be fired for incompetence. I never would have guessed that I could be associated with that perception. And so quite honestly, I went through a pretty significant sort of identity crisis. And that lasted about 20 minutes. Because <laughs> I got in the car and we drove from, I just flown back from Afghanistan and I had gone to my quarters just long enough to put my uniform, green uniform on and go to report to the presidency, president. And I get back to the, the quarters and I've got to tell my wife, Annie, of then 33 plus years of marriage that our, the life she'd signed up for and been part of was gone. And she stood in the, the uh, entrance to the home and she said, good, we've always been happy and we'll always be happy. And it was shocking because I think most people would expect their their best friend to come say, you know, give him a hug and say, I feel sorry for you, or you got screwed or, or something like that, you mm -hmm. know? And, yeah. And she didn't do that. She just said, okay, we move on. And she's been that way every moment since then. And what that did for me is, you know, clearly I went through a period of sort of grieving over what I'd lost because I had a career that I was proud of. I had a reputation. I, was proud of, and in an instant, it was either gone or endangered. But what we made the decision to do, and we never sat down and had a conversation about it. We did it by our actions, but, but Annie and I made the decision that we were gonna focus forward. And that what we were gonna try to do was, instead of going back and relitigating, that's for a lawyer there, um, <laughs> relitigating the past and arguing, we were just gonna say, okay, that happened. I am going to conduct myself in a way that anyone who ever meets me in the future who read that article will go, doesn't seem like that person described in that. Mm. That doesn't match. And rather than arguing about it and whatnot, that's the approach we'll take. And so, and then we decided to do some things like with a, with a friend of mine who'd been in Afghanistan, he said, let's start a company. And we had no idea what we were going to do. And we said, yeah, why not? How hard can that be? 
<laughs> so we <laughs> yeah, we started a company and we started doing a bunch of things. I started teaching a leadership class at Yale and we just started building this new life, all focused on what was important to us, which is the people that we cared about, the people that we'd made commitments to before. And then um, being what I thought I should be, you know, as, as a kind of person. And it was very interesting because that was a, a good motivator. I think if I wanted to, I could have gone to a cabin, you know, in the Northwest and sent pipe bombs to people I didn't like, you know, and to show my, my frustration. But this was the opposite. And it took a while. I'm not going to say that, you know, it was over in a day or a week or a year. And I can't say that even today, I don't sort of grieve for the fact that my military career, in my view, has an asterisk at the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, he was a good soldier, but, and every time someone writes an article about me, usually, you know, they say, well, he did this, 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 but he was, you know, and that hurts, that hurts a lot, but it doesn't define me. I've been able to have other things that that require me to get up in the morning and to be focused and to, and to be the kind of person I want to be. And again, I don't I don't get it right most days, but I get it more right than I would if I didn't have something important. And so my my lesson I always tell people is face forward. You know, history is great, but don't live there. Um, think about what you can and, and want to be. You mentioned identity as a leader, and I'm sure that that's something that a lot of high performing leaders can easily draw their identity, whether it's in the military, whether you're a general in the military or high ranking individual, or whether you're in the private sector, I'm sure you can, you can become synonymous with your position or the amount of power. Any thoughts on, you know, having gone through that navigated, obviously an incredible wife who was able to help remind you that that's not your identity. Uh, but any thoughts as you especially deal with leaders, private sector, public sector on just how to maybe navigate, maybe it is just how to keep your identity in check as you lead at, at high levels? Yeah, it, it is challenging because on the one hand, when you get a senior position, whether it's civilian world or military, there's a role you fulfill and there's so there are certain uh, things you do to fulfill that part, the expectations of that part. CEOs act a certain way within, you know, a range. Same with generals and admirals and whatnot. I think the most important thing is first to remember that part of that is theatrics. Part of it is you are going through rituals. You are acting certain ways because that's the way that person in that position acts in that. The second is be very... Um, quick to remind yourself that you are not as smart as you think you are. And even if they laugh, your jokes aren't quite as funny as you know you consider them to be. Because it all comes back at a certain point, life does come back around. I don't care who you were. When you're not that, you're not that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not a general anymore. You know, people, you know, call me general because I guess that's just a nice thing to do but I always ask him not to not to just be informal with people but that's not my role now mm. my role is something different and so I shouldn't pretend that that's what I'm doing or who I am and I shouldn't pretend to myself you know I was I wasn't a general for most of my life for a very short period I was a general and then Afterward, I'm not a general anymore. So it, it's a good way to, to just bring you back down to earth. Hmm. I think that's important. That's an important distinction too of the language you use, even the language you use internally about yourself. How do you define yourself? What labels do you put? Uh, for me, it's a, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Like the things you tell yourself, because you're right. I mean, it, it, you could easily say, I don't, don't call me general. That's just something I do, but there is meaning to that. Um, and I, I, that's very instinctive or that's very insightful. Uh, I want to, so there, I was watching a speech you gave to the Stanford graduate school of business and you had this great quote 
in this speech at the end that really stood out to me. You said, leadership is not a talent or a gift. It's a choice. It's not complex, but it's very hard. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. You know, I think vision or brilliance or anything, those are things that you are either blessed with or expertise you develop over time. Leadership is something you actually do. It's not something you have, you know, that you're not born with it, I don't think. You're taught some of it, but I believe it's really a choice, meaning when you're a young lieutenant, I remember the first thing we're taught is you're responsible for your troops. And one of the things you're responsible for is their feet. And so as a young paratroop lieutenant, we're doing foot marches. It's my responsibility to make them take their boots off and me to look at their stinky feet. And I mean, they could do that. They could look at each other's, but the point is that's my responsibility. And that's what I have to do. It's not one of the sexier parts of the job but it is something that is very basic and goes back to World War I and the trench foot and whatnot. But accepting the responsibility of leadership and knowing that there are times when you've got to make the hard decision and you've got to accept the unpopularity associated with, you know, telling people that they have to do something that they don't want to do, that sort of thing. Um, those are acceptances of responsibility that actually are a high level of leadership. You know, accepting uh, responsibility for something happens uh, that, that isn't good is leadership. Putting yourself at risk is leadership. Making yourself sacrifice, whether it's lack of sleep, lack of food, all those things, those are all parts of leadership. And those are choices that you make. And you can talk yourself out of making them. Sometimes you can convince yourself, well, I really don't need to do that because it's not my role. It's more important for me to do something else. But there should be a little voice inside that says, you know, that's, I'm really not doing the best leadership now that I could be doing and should be doing. And it gets back to role models. You watch them do that and you go, you know, I'm gonna, I hope I remember to do that when I'm in, in that kind of a role. You, you also say that leadership is not complex, but it's very hard. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, I think there are complex decisions that get involved in leadership. There are complex issues. But the reality is on most of those, you can get people to help you get the right answer. You know, you can get uh, very experienced people to give you the range of options and all like that. So all you've really got to do is have a multiple choice test and pick the right answer. And usually there's somebody telling you what it is, but you have to make it. You know, you can't, you know, Dwight David Eisenhower planned the, the invasion of Normandy. I mean, he didn't actually do all that plan in the detailed stuff, but in the final moments, when he had to make the decision whether to go on the 6th of June or not, he could get advice from everybody, but he had to make the decision. And part of that was in, in leadership. He didn't try to give it to anybody else. He got their opinions and then he said, okay, this is my responsibility. So it is, it boils down often to those very tough things that are often distasteful or dangerous or those kinds of things. And that's where real leadership comes in. And so when people try to say, no, this is something that's, very, very uh, hard for people to understand. No, it's not. It's hard to do. Mm. I'm glad you brought up decision making because you've spent pretty much your whole life as a professional decision maker. And so I'd love to get any tips for leaders on just how to make effective and, and good decisions. Yeah, I mean, I've made some good ones and I made some not good ones. So, you know, like many leaders, I got experience from that standpoint. I think the first point is pretty obvious. Understand what decision you're making. What, what actually is the decision and what's the impact of it? And then from that is, should you be making that decision or should somebody else? Should it be down below you or maybe above you? Um, and then the next one is, when do you have to make that decision? You know, some days you say, it's better to make the decision now. Well, not always. 
if, if it isn't needed till later, if there's not value in making it earlier, you might get more insights before. Some of the best decisions are ones where I've just stepped back and said, no, I got to think about that. I got to get more information. And then in other cases, if you're not making a decision that really needs to be made because of execution time, then you're just avoiding the tough part of leadership. But, but that's another key one. Then when you come to a decision, understand that you actually have to make a decision. I learned one of these things from uh, General Abizade when he was director of the Joint Staff and I was the vice director of operations, early 2000s. And we would, we would have an issue and we would staff it out all across the, the Joint Staff and Department of Defense and the military services and everybody come back, come and said, the, the person, the action officer managing it would have a tendency to, to want to deal with all the comments by sanding off the rough edges of the decision. And what we would often get is this lowest common denominator decision that actually had no value whatsoever. If you really need to make a decision between go left or go right, and that what comes back, it says, well, kind of go in the middle and stop and wait and see, then you realize you didn't make a decision. So it's very important to understand that some decisions are binary or close to it. You got to do either or. And so you have to clearly identify that if you're the decision maker, make sure that they put it in front of you that way. And then you make a decision. And then most of the things I've seen in the military don't go bad on the decision. They go bad on the execution. And so I'm a great believer that the technique that was taught me by John Vines. He commanded the 82nd when I was at Sixth Division Commander. He said there are two phases to decision-making. Phase one is where we get all the information in, we consider all the different options. And then at the end of phase one, we make a decision. Phase two is when we execute that decision. In phase two, you don't revisit phase one <laughs> unless something has changed that is so dramatic that you have to. Otherwise, you execute. And there's a number of people who never want to let go of phase one. And so they're, they're kind of tentative and they want to revisit it and they want to undercut it or be passive aggressive. It's really important for organizations to understand, and I use this analogy, when the Higgins boat hits the beach and the ramp drops, it's not time to discuss the plan. I've heard Pat Lencioni talk about this in, in the context of decision-making of like, there's this initial part where you're, you're really inviting feedback. You want people to get buy-in. You want people to bring, you want everybody to come to the table, give me feedback. Let's embrace conflict around ideas. But then there is that shift of, okay, is, is that, do you agree with that view of, of decision-making of there is a point where I do want to encourage debate. I do want to encourage conflict to get to the right decision, but then we do need to shift and then execute. Yeah, ab absolutely. And when you say shift, I might have put the word shut up in there. We need to <laughs> shut up and execute. <laughs> I want to ask you about leadership as an entrepreneur and as a as a business leader. I've heard you say that leadership in the in the military in some ways is easier than what you've seen in the business world or the private sector. What are some of the keys you've seen to effective leadership as an entrepreneur and, and in the in the private sector? Yeah. Um, you're right. The structure in the military and some of the guardrails actually make military leadership easier. Now, in combat, it's a little more complex again, but it's, it's still the structure helps. In an entrepreneurial world, I think one of the first things is you have to be decisive. You don't have the time or the ability to, to not make clear choices. You have to do this or you have to do that. Uh, if it doesn't mean that you can't come back and adapt. If you, if you make the wrong decision and things go bad, you start adjusting, that's fine. But you've got to make a decision and you got to move. A lot of small startups that I've uh, seen and been involved with, five years in, they're producing and offering a very different product than they started the company with. The plan was we're going to sell donuts. And four or five years later, they're selling computers. And you go, well, how did that happen? Well, they start a certain way and they found there was a better market for this opportunity and they were able to adapt. That doesn't mean you don't make decisions. That doesn't mean you step back for five years and wait until the perfect product comes and then you execute because you won't learn that way. 
what you've got to do is execute. And then when you get feedback, you find out that that needs to be adjusted. You iterate, you iterate decisively again. Um, people want to be led, meaning they don't want to be commanded in the sense of when I say they want to be led, they're not sheep who are just sitting there being told, okay, stand up, sit down, go left, right. But they do want to sense that the organization's going in a direction. And a lot of times, uh, particularly in the civilian world, if you can provide clear direction and a narrative that supports that, this is what we're doing and this is why we are doing that, it's very important to the members of the team because they do want to know that we know what we're trying to do here. We have purpose here. And they also understand that there's an underlying logic behind it, whether it's values or, or whatever it is. They want to believe that. And then, then you can unlock a lot of uh, commitment out of people. I wonder if you could take us to one of your meetings. So I, I have heard you say that before COVID, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you guys were meeting on Fridays. You would do a big uh, Miss Crystal group meeting where you'd go over you know, the, the priorities. Uh, and then with, when COVID hit, it sounded like you, you shifted to a daily meeting. Uh, and I, I believe you've said that's in the morning. Um, I'm just curious if you could, could tell us, you know, maybe coach some leaders a little bit of how, how often should you meet? And what, what do those meetings look like? How long do they last? What, what, are you, what do you say? What do they say? What are the, what's the focus of them? Yeah, it's funny because sometimes you do something and, and when you do it, you know that it's the right thing to do. And you also know that you knew what was right a long time before you actually did. And, and I go back to when I was in JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. We had this geographically dispersed organization and we put in a 90 minute a day secure video, video teleconference for the whole command. It ended up being 7,500 people a day, every day for 90 minutes. And most people just scream when they hear that, they go, that's <laughs> insanity. But it was a remarkably effective. And it was this conversation across this very globally uh, dispersed element. When McChrystal Group was founded, we're just under a hundred people. And we're, we do consulting and a couple other things. So we're geographically dispersed and we're trying to figure out our own battle rhythm. And so we were doing once a week, what we call a keystone forum. And we get the entire organization together and we talk about what the situation is, update certain things, finances. We, we cross level lessons learned. And it was effective, but we were, we always sort of in the back of our minds said, you know, we're not sure we got this right because, but we thought, well, we're not at war, we're civilians now. So, and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, our COO made the decision. He says, okay, we can't mess around. We gotta, we gotta talk every day because we're not in an office together, even part of us. So we gotta get on and, and we'll sync every day. And uh, we started doing that. And we had to, to do a lot of adjustment for McChrystal Group to, to survive the headwinds that every you know, firm ran into at the beginning of uh, COVID. And then we found it was working. It was not only working a little bit, it was working really well. And so then when COVID started to subside, we said, hey, don't, you know, don't lose a good thing. So what we do is we meet every morning for 30 minutes, the entire team. And we've got a very set agenda and it varies a little bit by day. We have a slightly different agenda each day, but it's run by our director of operations. And the entire organization figures out, okay, what's the situation? What are we trying to do? And what are some key information we got to pass? And it's very much everybody talking across as we do this. And then we break. On Fridays, we do longer. We call it extended. We do an hour and a half of it. We go into greater detail on some things. And what it does is it passes information so we can be constantly learning from each other and nimble, but also it builds our culture. It keeps us connected. And we felt that was important during COVID and it's still important. COVID's not completely gone, but even now that part of us are back in offices, that daily bringing the team together into the huddle and checking signals is just incredibly valuable. And technology, if you do it efficiently, will let you do that with sort of low overhead. And it stops a lot of the other meetings that, that might be uh, needed. 
So when you're in that meeting, uh, what are some key components to it? I, Cause I, I'm just trying to picture what that might look like. Cause I've seen a lot of different meetings. Some meetings are just, just putting out, Hey, those are my priorities. Some are where we talk about our values. We reiterate values. I'm just curious because maybe get a little more tactical for leaders out there. What, what are some key ingredients to those meetings that you think are that other leaders could replicate? It's a great point. Uh, it's a little bit of all of that. So every time we get the meeting together, we start by just showing our priorities and say, here's the priorities now. And if they've changed, we say, if they haven't, okay, just boom, only takes a little bit. Then we go into some key information everybody needs to know. Call them headlines on the newspaper. Here are four or five things that everyone in this company, maybe it's an upcoming event, a change to something, you need to know, be tracking this. Now we do a, a very short COVID update. What's the situation with COVID? How does that affect, uh, impact us? Then we'll go into scheduling things that are happening. Okay, everybody, the next few days, we have this, 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 and we coordinate that part. And then we'll go into a sales part where we look at all the different potential clients we have coming up and we're coordinating so that we are uh, doing all the preparation so we interact with them most effectively. And, and we update people, okay, here's the status of these and whatnot. And then when we come to the end of the, the briefing, we give anybody an opportunity, we have cross level some experiences recently, open it up for anyone in the company. And then the, the key leaders, myself, the COO and the president of the company, we all take, have a short period to talk. Sometimes we are just, hey, good job team, well done. Sometimes it's, hey, everybody, here's something I want you to think about, whether it's based on our values or whatever. Sometimes it's, hey, everybody, I'm not happy with this. I want everybody to think about this and we're focused. And it's not long, but each of us get a chance. And so they're hearing from senior leadership, not long speeches, but, you know, a minute maybe. And it, it allows us to revisit values, revisit key things as we go. And then, of course, there are other interactions during the day, but we find that this really pulls the team tight. Do you spend a lot of time preparing for that meeting? I, one thing I've kind of gleaned recently is just how much time a lot of times leaders spend preparing for meetings. You know, you, you would think that sometimes you hop on a meeting and you just, it's just spontaneous, but I'm curious from your perspective, is that something you spend a lot of time deliberately preparing for? It doesn't take a lot of time, but... I can tell when a leader is prepared when they are prepared hmm. and the leader's just sort of talking off the top of their head and it's probably got that amount of value. So what I'll typically do is before that meeting, I have a sync meeting with my exec assistant who's a partner in the company and I've worked with for many years and she'll give great insights and we'll talk about scheduling things. And I will use that time and whatnot to start to make some notes about what I want to talk about in front of the entire group. And I'll make other comments during the normal, what we call Keystone Forum. But my comments at the end, I've normally had time to think about and says, I really want to talk to him about this issue. Uh, and that gives you a, a chance to make sure you, you want to set the right tone that the way you communicate it. So, uh, sir, thanks so much for, for investing this much time. I want to do a quick lightning round with you here at the very end. Um, and uh, first question is, what is one habit, routine, or ritual that for you has made the biggest positive difference? For me, it's working out. I work out every morning and, and I'm fairly intense personality and I find that lets some of the air out of the balloon. If I don't do that, I'm not this, I'm bad Stan more, more of the day. I can totally relate to that. Are you still, are you still getting around four hours of sleep or is that uh, a JSOC thing? That was a JSOC thing. I now sleep as much as I can, sometimes not. I was going to say during meetings, but no, <laughs> I, I really try to hit balance now. What time are you typically waking up? I get up about 4.45. Uh, and I, I'm, an, I'm a morning person, but mm. I don't know what's on late night TV because I never see it. Mm. What is your top piece of marriage or relationship advice? It's hard work. You know, people talk, they say you meet someone, you fall in love, you get married, and you live happily ever after. And I would say, no, you forgot the part where you got to work at it all the time. Because you change, they change, situation changes, 
you can't take anything for granted. So uh, I've only been married once, so I'm not an expert in it, but I've been very happy in it. And I'd say that if you're not working at it, you're taking something for granted that you shouldn't. Mm, that's good. What's your top parenting advice? <laughs> Maintain the relationship. There was a period when my son, I only had one son, my wife and I, and he was a punk rocker with a mohawk and that the mohawk would co change color every so often as he, you know, uh, wanted to have, sport a different look. And at that point in life, I was an active duty army officer. It's a little upsetting to have a kid who's, you know, looks like that, but we never judged him. We never got in arguments with him. We just kind of laughed and said, you know, we're going to, going to hold this against you someday. We're going to hold the pictures. Well, we maintained a good relationship. And nowadays he lives next door to me. He works for the U S government. You know, he, he looks very corporate and I give him a hard time about it. Um, but, but it's remember that everybody goes through something and, and, and give a little bit, you know, don't, don't judge or try to oversteer. And, and it's worked for us. That makes me think of my skater days. Uh, I used to be a big <laughs> rollerblader <laughs> and my dad, he would take me, he would take me to the skate park. And, you know, I reflected on that today. I just really appreciated that he was able to come into my world, even though it was a world he was yeah. not familiar with. I, I want to, so imagine you're speaking to, but you probably have done this many times, speaking to a group of uh, soon to be college graduates, and you could just give them one piece of advice. What would it be? Yeah. Have some experiences while you're young. You know, when you're 35 and you have a significant other and you got kids and a dog and a mortgage, there are things you can't do. And so when you're young, go have adventures, you know, do things that will build your experience base and something very different, strange, you know, push the, the limit a little bit because you will be glad you did it later. You can start doing it again when you're 60 and you retire, but you know, there's a number of years when you're more limited. What is one thing right now? There's a lot in our country that we could highlight as negative, but what's one thing that you're really excited about with our country right now? We're having a very important conversation about equality, whether it's racial equality, gender equality, economic equality, and not everybody's agreeing on it, but it is so overdue and it needs to be a little sharper than I think it's been in the past. And we need to come to some hard conclusions because at the end of the day, I think one of the great vulnerabilities of any society is if you have inequalities that are built in systemically that people can't overcome because those of us who travel around the world and seen places, that's a recipe for a weakened society. And so I think those are the things I'd really like to see us lean into. I'm really excited to hear that you have a new book coming out uh, about risk. Uh, so in the last just couple minutes we have, I was, I was hoping you could tell us one about the, the new book coming out, where people can find it and where people can, can connect with you and follow you. Yeah, thanks, Cal. It's, uh, the title is Risk, A User's Guide. And I realize that's an ambitious title, but the reality is I spent a lifetime dealing with risk, but I don't think I ever really understood it. And I don't think I thought about it correctly. And so what we did was we studied that, not just me, but we studied different aspects. And we came out with a conclusion that just like the human immune system protects our body, we have a risk immune system in, in every organization that protects the organization. And most of the time when we get in trouble, it's not the threat that actually causes us a problem or the risks out there. It is the fact that our own immune system is weak. We've allowed it to, to not be resilient, to not be strong. And that's all within our control. And so interestingly, our ability to deal with risk begins at home and we need to focus on that. And when is the book coming out, Stan? comes out October 5th and we'll start, you know, going on TV and doing that stuff. And uh, I think it'll be, you know, we wrote it, we started it before COVID-19 arrived. And so COVID-19, the story is part of the book. And I think people will find that the points we're making were things that have been reflected in their personal experience over the last year and a half. Well, sir, it has been a true honor and a privilege to have you on the day. I appreciate the time investment uh, in this 
group of people listening today. I'll give you the last word uh, if you have any parting advice for leaders, but I just want to let you know, I really appreciate your time. Well, Cal, thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for what you do on a daily basis. And thanks for what you're doing with this focus on leadership. It's my honor. 